I've been uh, presenting a historical perspective on the contribution of uh, studies in yeast to understanding cancer and with a particular focus on cell cycle control and yeast effectively because yeast is a single cell it lives in a defined media and it just divides and grows and divides and grows and it's got very strong genetics it's got excellent cell biology so it's been a real driver of our understanding of the control of cell division. When you don't understand how a process works um, I mean you have to try and find uh, clues as to how to do it uh, how, how is that process controlled? And using yeast genetics is a totally unprejudiced way. So effectively, you can isolate a series of mutations, uh, a series of con uh, mutants that cannot grow at one temperature but can grow at another temperature. You have no idea what you're looking for. And then slowly you can build up the characterization of those mutations. Event you can define the regulation maps without really knowing the identity of the genes. You can work out the relationship between the genes. But then ultimately you can clone the genes, find the identity of the genes, and put those functions onto the map of the cell division cycle that you've created. And so this was done in the 1970s and uh, 1980s by Lee Hartwell, Paul Nurse and all of their colleagues and they defined a series of concepts which have really underpinned our understanding of cell division. And so they defined the concept of start where one takes a decision to commit to the cell cycle and this is, this is a process that happens in, before the cells have duplicated their DNA and it's very analogous to the restriction point. It was defined around the same time by a guy called Arthur Pardee in some really seminal work. He had used human tissue culture and he had put on serum, taken it off, put on serum, taken off a bit later, a bit later. And he discovered there's a point at which once you remove serum, the cells will keep going regardless. So there's a rate limiting step in both the yeast cell cycle and the malian cell cycle. And the work in yeast defined, uh, in, well, there are two yeasts. There's the budding yeast and there's a the fission yeast. And this work's been done in both of the yeasts. Their lifestyles are very different. Their cell cycles are very different. And so we've learned uh, complementary answers from the two different yeasts. And so work in the fission yeast defined, showed that there are actually two rate-limiting steps and showed that there's, a, there's, two, there's one gene that acts at both of those steps and that it could be mutated to either accelerate the cycle or slow down the cycle. Subsequently, it was found that the, that particular gene was very similar to the, the gene that regulated start in the budding yeast. And then ultimately, the human equivalent of that gene was cloned, and that gene was called CDC2. We now know it's CDK1. And so that was a really major uh, um, advance that came really quite rapidly. It, it's almost analogous, if you think about the way that we look in an unprejudiced way for finding um, cell cycle mutations without knowing what they're about, it's the same as sequencing the genome. We don't know what's gone wrong in a cancer. Let's open up the bonnet and have a look at the engine underneath and find out what it looks like and then find out what it looks like when the process has gone wrong. It's effectively the same kind of philosophy. However, it's really unlocked understanding of the cell cycle. And there's one other uh, really, perhaps the most important contribution that's come from yeast in terms of understanding cell cycle control. And in fact, biological processes in general has been the concept of the checkpoint. And this came from a really seminal paper from uh, Lee Hartwell and Ted Weiner in 1989. And effectively, it's describing a dependency relationship. So you have the cell cycle, it's just inevitably going, cells will inevitably divide, but if you damage them, they've got to stop that division, otherwise they, will, they won't be able to do it very well because they're damaged, but actually they'll propagate that to the next generation. So it's essential that you stop that process, and so there's a series of pathways, checkpoint pathways, which will sense some damage in DNA or a, a number of issues, and they will feed into the core cell cycle controls, and they'll stop that cell cycle control from happening. And <clears throat> obviously now we know the molecules that are involved in those checkpoint pathways and they're major targets in cancers because one of the first things that happens in a cancer is that the genome gets jumbled up and it accumulates damage and so it becomes more and more dependent upon DNA damage, DNA replication checkpoint controls. And really you can trace all of this um, sort of approach really to the original yeast uh, concept that came from Hartwell and Weinert.
One of the points that I kind of stressed in the talk, which is a real yeast cell cycle nerd perspective to some extent, is I, I mentioned that, that start is a commitment point. It's a rate limiting step, so if cells are small, they wait until they get to the right size to go through start. And then um, the second uh, rate limiting step of going into mitosis is also a rate limiting step. And then on top of that, you have checkpoints. And currently, <coughs> there's a bit of a confusion. Everything has become a checkpoint. Everything has become the G1S checkpoint or the G2M checkpoint. And in reality, it's really important to think about what's a rate limiting step and what's a commitment point and what's a checkpoint. So in terms of pure checkpoint inhibitors, one has to think about what a checkpoint is. And a checkpoint is the signal that there's been some damage, there's then a transduction pathway, and there's then a target of that um, particular um, uh, checkpoint. So the classic checkpoint DNA damage checkpoint, you would have DNA PK, protein kinase at the, that would recognize the DNA damage. That's druggable and there are drugs being developed to that. That will then signal to uh, check kinases and there are, there's check one, check two, depending upon whether it's replication or DNA damage. And there are inhibitors to those. Uh, the intermediate kinase, ATM, ATR, will be um, triggering those check kinases, and so there are inhibitors to those. So those I would regard as sort of classic checkpoint pathways. They then feed in to control um, a protein kinase called WE1, and WE1 controls the activity of the CDK cycling complex. I didn't mention the massive contribution from Xenopus, where Effectively, the CDC2 gene that Paul Nurse had found that was really important for controlling the timing of division is partnered by a regulatory subunit called cyclin. That provides a specificity and provides the activity, takes it to its substrates. And the activity of the CDK cycling complex is regulated by WE1 kinase. And <clears throat> WE1 shoves on inhibitory phosphates when the time is right. Those phosphates are removed by CDC25 phosphatase, and that's how you enter division. So obviously, when you have DNA damage or you have any of the, the replication checkpoints, they'll feed in to both WE1 and CDC25. They will enhance the activity of WE1, which will keep you from dividing, and they'll reduce the activity of CDC25, which will keep you from dividing even further. And so something that's showing real uh, promise and great excitement at the moment is inhibiting WE1. So <clears throat> one can think of it as a checkpoint inhibitor, but actually, from my perspective, I'd say, yes, it's the target of the checkpoint that comes in, but actually it's also a major rate-limiting step. And so that one has a particular appeal uh, because whatever the, the damage that is being done, whatever checkpoints are happening, and so when you have a... Um, a, a cancer cell, it's gone through oncogenic stress, it is reliant on multiple checkpoint pathways. Ultimately, they all feed into WE1. It's like the bottleneck. And so people are using WE1 inhibitors now to great effect. And effectively, what you do is you advance the timing of commitment to division, and that just sends you into mitosis, so into the pr physical process of division with a huge amount of damage, and you trigger all kinds of... Um, checkpoint pathways within mitosis. So you, you trigger apoptosis from within mitosis or in the subsequent next cell cycle because you, you've really done things way before you should have done. Normal tissues haven't accumulated so much damage, they're not reliant upon these checkpoint pathways, and so there's a real therapeutic window between the transformed cell and the, the neighboring uh, normal tissue because the transformed cell has effectively become addicted to checkpoint control in order to survive. There's a huge amount that we can still learn. One of the great features of yeast is that it is, uh, it's a single-celled organism that does virtually everything that we do, uh, uh, that our single cells will do in isolation. It's got fantastic genetics, we can do a huge amount with it. Consequently, in the last uh, 15 years, there have been four Nobel Prizes. There's the cell cycle one I was talking about. There's telomeres from Jack Shostak. There's secretion Randy Sheckman. There is now um, Osumi has just got the uh, Nobel for autophagy this year. And the reason is, is because basically fundamental processes can be taken apart in the yeast. But one of the ways that we, the, one of the processes by which we take things apart is we have a hypothesis, we make a mutant, and then we can cross it into numerous genetic backgrounds, 
And invariably, we find the, the process doesn't exactly work how we, we think it does, but we're in a new place. We do many more crosses, introduce more genetic backgrounds, so we can very rapidly move through to define signaling networks and signaling pathways. And <clears throat> the dawn of CRISPR and genome editing has been, is fantastic in humans. It, it, it's amazing because it allows us to really go in with some precision questions. The challenge is everything has to be done sequentially. So the, the real power of the yeast still persists because we can define the questions. We can use yeast as the test tube in which to define exactly what you should do when you go into humans. So an example of that is the work we're doing in our laboratory. We're, there's been a lot of excitement in many signaling transduction cascades and in the cell cycle of the contribution of protein kinases. And protein kinases put phosphate onto molecules to change their function. So in order to send you into division, CDK cyclins will, CDK1, cyclin B, will put phosphate on lots of proteins. The protein now accumulates phosphate and changes. Now, obviously, when you leave mitosis, you've got to take all those off again. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in mitosis forever. And the study of phosphatases that do that removal of the phosphates has really lagged behind kinases. And the reason for this is that protein kinases are easy to assay. You can pull down your kinase by immunoprecipitation. You can mix it with casein, histone H1, histone H3, myelin basic protein, and a bit of ATP and in a range of buffers, you've got an assay. With the phosphatases, you really need the specific uh, target phosphorylated in your assay in order to be able to determine what the specific phosphatase activity is. So consequently, the understanding of phosphatases in virtually all fields in cancer biology, apart from the signal transduction of tyrosine phosphatases, the, the sort of the core serine threonine phosphatase, we really know very little about. So in our laboratory, we are using the ability, the fact that we can run the yeast cell on one, two, sometimes no phosphatases, and just establish core rules by which protein phosphatases are regulated. And just to put some perspective on that, in with the protein phosphatase 2A family, there are, there are um, uh, regulatory, structural, and catalytic subunits, so it's a trimer. There are multiple genes encoding the catalytic, multiple genes encoding the structural. Then there are four types of regulatory. There are multiple genes encoding each of the regulatory. And then all of those genes, every gene is subject to um, uh, differential splicing. So the PP2A B55 family in humans is pro can be around 280, we don't know. B56 is the same, whereas in fish and yeast we can run the yeast on one PP2A B55 or none. And so we have uh, we've described an unexpected relationship whereby one of the major protein phosphatases, protein phosphatase 1 regulates protein phosphatase 2A, and we have worked in collaboration with John Pines to show that this is conserved through to humans. And now we are using yeast as a test tube in which to define the next level of regulation. How is that relationship controlled? What's the impact? What's the target on the PP2A? We'll define that in yeast. Then we move to humans. And so that's one area where we're really, and that's just one example. There are many areas where the yeast stuff will still hold its head up and, and guide the way for human uh, cell cycle research.